All right, hello everyone, and welcome to another class of uh, Geomechanics PG334. Today we're going to continue talking about faults, and we are going to go through the topic of ideal orientation of faults, and later to the determination of normal and shear stress on the fault plane when the fault may not be ideally oriented. All right, so uh, I hope you have seen the previous lecture. If not, just check the previous video, video because there is uh, quite a bit of content there that you're going to need in order to understand uh, this lecture. Particularly, uh, you should know what is a strike and dip of a fault because we're going to use that uh, right now. And also, you should get to know how to use stereo nets. Okay, let's start talking about ideal orientation of faults. Uh, we have seen in the previous chapter that uh, depending on the stress regime, we might find faults that correspond to that particular stress regime, either that's normal faulting, strike sleep, or reverse. And what we're going to do now is to try to understand in a given stress regime what would be the ideal orientation of a fault. In that location. So if the stresses were enough to cause a fault, what will be the orientation of that fault? And this is very useful because when you sample fractures in the subsurface, uh, you want to know if those are shear fractures or they are hydraulic fractures or what they are and what is the relationship with the stress regime. So I have a figure here which is completely, uh, uh, completely done but uh, what I'm going to do instead is we're going to work uh, this case from scratch for the case of normal faulting. So uh, let's uh, do that. Let me start my notes. And this will be a little bit easier in order to understand how we obtain this ideal orientation of faults. So basically, I'm just going to repeat uh, that figure. OK. so. Let's get started with this. What I'd like to, to do now is to find out what is the ideal orientation of a fault given a stress regime that we know. And we're going to start with the case of normal faulting. So as we all know, for normal fault faulting, the maximum principal stress is vertical. And then I have two horizontal stresses that are going to be lower than the minimum, than the maximum vertical stress. All right. And for this particular condition, also uh, similar to what I have in this figure over here, uh, we're going to assume that the minimum principal stress is oriented in the east-west direction. And this is just one assumption I'm making here, but depending on your site, it could be different. For example, if you remember the case for the Permian Basin, the minimum principal stress goes north-south. Well, in this case, we're going to make it, assume in this case, goes east-west. And we're going to select a block of the subsurface which I'm going to draw here as a rectangle. And with these particular conditions, uh, what I'm assuming is that the minimum principal stress goes east-west. If the minimum principal horizontal stress goes east-west, the maximum horizontal stress should be perpendicular to that and should go in direction north-south. And S1, the maximum principal stress, I'm going to make it here a little bit thicker, that's going to be the vertical stress. And in this case, we're also assuming that a vertical stress is a principal stress, and uh, the principal stress, maximum principal stress is vertical. OK, so now the question is, what is the ideal orientation of a fault? And in order to do that, what we need to do is to recognize 
what is the maximum principal stress and what is the minimum principal stress and the intermediate stress. In this case, the maximum principal stress is SV, right? So this one is S1. The intermediate principal stress is SH max. And the minimum principal stress is SH min. According to the theory of shear failure, I'm going to have a ideal shear fracture in these conditions that is going to be caused because the value of S1 is too large compared to the value of S3. And I'm over this uh, friction uh, limit that relates the two effective stresses. And when that occurs, when S1 is over the limit of S3 and the rock breaks, what is going to happen is it's going to form shear planes which are going to be oriented at an angle with respect to the plane where the maximum principal stress is applied, which in this case, this is the plane of SV. And this is going to be the ideal orientation of such shear failure. All right, so let's try to understand why I drew this plane like this. Uh, first of all, we need to recognize uh, what is going to be the orientation of this plane. And if you notice this plane, it's on the same uh, direction of the intermediate stress. So this line of the intermediate stress is contained in this plane, which means that S2 is really not affecting the direction of that plane. It's not affecting the orientation because it's in, it's in the same plane. The ones that are causing the orientation of that plane are S1 and S3. And notice also that if this rock, this mass of rock were to fail, this part will move down and this one will move up. And why? Because the maximum stress, S1, is pushing down this block. And because it is larger than S3 and with the appropriate uh, orientations uh, decomposed on the plane of the fault, S1 is going to be pushing down, is going to do work that is going to move this fault uh, block down, and this is going to be opposed by the minimum principal stress, which is S3. And uh, this one is going to move to the right a little bit, opposing S3. And that's the reason why this strike of this fault is perpendicular to the direction of S3 because as the block moves down, it does work against the minimum principal stress. And it does it against the minimum principal stress because that's a configuration of the least consumption of energy. For example, if I had a fault that would be doing work against the intermediate principal stress, it would have to do uh, this stress will have to do a lot more work to move against S2 because it's just a larger stress. And it doesn't make much sense why to do work against S2, which is larger, if you can do it against S3, which is lower. And that's why the orientation of this plane uh, goes moving against the direction of S3. But remember that this is at a certain angle. This is not parallel to any of these stresses, either S1 or S3, is at a certain angle, and that angle is the angle beta, where beta is going to be equal to, let me write it over here, of 45 degrees plus the friction angle divided by 2. 
And for this particular case, let's assume that the friction angle is equal to 30 degrees. Uh, you will see that that uh, will make our life a little bit easier. Uh, for this particular example, also uh, we're going to have here that this is going to be 60 degrees. And this kind of confirms what we have already seen with our previous samples that when we loaded those with the maximum direction in the vertical direction, we will observe steep fractures happening at an angle uh, beta, which in this case is 60 degrees, from the plane of the maximum stress, which in this case is the plane of S1. Let me add a little bit of uh, color here because this plane is going to be very important. This plane is the plane of the maximum stress. When you measure the angle between this plane of maximum stress with the plane of the fault, the angle is going to be uh, beta. And we're going to see that this is going to be this go condition is going to hold for all our cases. Uh, it's going also going to be valid for strike slip, and will also be valid for reverse faulting. We'll just work on those a little bit later, but you will see that it, it is exactly the same thing. You just need to recognize which one is S1 and which one is S3. And as soon as you do that, also, you know what is S2. OK, so uh, let's continue uh, characterizing this particular fault that we have just drawn in here. The next thing that we're going to do is uh, we're going to locate those on a stereo net projection. Um, before we do that, uh, we're going to see what is the strike and dip of this ideal fracture or ideal fault in this particular example. All right, so uh, remember that we have here a, a coordinate system. So according to this coordinate system, I can see that we're going to call this one fault number one. So for fault number one, I have that the strike is equal to uh, a direction that goes from north to south. So if I, you look at the strike, this is the strike, this is the line of the strike, and it's going exactly direction of the north. So that was going to be in strike of zero degrees. And the dip is going to be the angle between a horizontal plane which is this plane over here, and the plane of the fault, which is in this case beta. So in this particular case, the dip is equal to the angle beta. And this is going to be 60 degrees dipping towards the east. So notice that the strike is controlled by the direction of the horizontal stresses and what is the orientation of that stress. In this case, in which the minimum horizontal stress is pointing in direction east-west, my strike is zero degrees. But if I had this at any other angle, the strike of such fall will change. The dip it's not going to change because the dip is going to depend only on the friction angle for this particular case, but the strike will change if the orientation of the horizontal stresses changes too. All right. This is one possible solution to the problem, but there is another solution which is also possible. Uh, in this particular case, I made this fault to be dipping towards the east, but there is no reason for preventing to have another fault that could have the same strike, but instead of dipping towards the east, will be dipping towards the west. And that would be, for example, this other fault that I'm drawing here in green, that will be oriented with the same dip, but will go into opposite direction. So 
hope this drawing comes out well. This is just a plane that is going to be also oriented at an angle beta from the vertical, but instead of dipping towards the east, it's going to be dipping towards the west. And fold number two will have a strike of, let me write it a little bit differently. We're going to use the, the notation that uh, we were uh, that we learned in the in the previous class. This could also be uh, just simply a dip that goes north to south, and the dip is going to be in this case 60 degrees towards the west. So there are two possible solutions for this problem, and these are called conjugate solutions. If you remember when you were calculating the roots of a parabola, uh, you call those two solutions uh, conjugate solutions, uh, especially when you had I imaginary numbers. So there are two solutions for the problems that uh, they are uh, symmetric with respect to each other. And they are both possible. There are two possible solutions uh, to the problem. And here, this is why also you can see uh, why in our in the case uh, we were talking before, we said that we could have structures like a graben or a horst in which the hanging wall may be depressed compared to the foot wall on the left, on the right, because both solutions are possible. And when they combine, they yield this type of structures like the one we saw. Uh, before and let me show what I mean uh, exactly something like this so something like this structure is possible because we have two conjugate solutions and in this case now we can see they are normal folds because they are quite a steep uh, with respect to a horizontal plane okay so uh, let's come back uh, to here the next thing that we're going to do is for this ideal direction of a fault uh, happening in a normal faulting regime, uh, we're also going to plot what is the corresponding stereo net and what is the corresponding more circle for that. All right, so let me come back over here. And it's very useful to locate the orientation of, of faults with, with uh, stereo nets. So here I'm going to draw a stereo net. These are the circles that we use for stereo nets, where the top is north, and then we have the west the east and the south, and we have concentric circles that also tell us what the deep of those uh, faults are. So for fault number one, uh, notice what is the 3D orientation of that. If I were to draw a perpendicular line to this fault going down, that would intercept the stereo net at a position which would be right here. This is going to be fault number one. So you see here, I'm extending a, a perpendicular line to fault number one going down, and this should be the pole of such uh, fault. If uh, we want to add what would be the strike line, I'm going to do it here, but usually we, we don't do that in this type of plot because with the, with the pole is enough, that would be the strike line. Let's add 
number two. Uh, number two is uh, going to be over here. And that will be the pole, which will be an imaginary line that extends perpendicularly from the plane of all two, perpendicular to that plane, intercepting the lower hemisphere. And that's the pole number two. And the strike line will be uh, somewhere over there. Remember that the position of the pole, uh, you can see how that is related to strike, but it also means, or it also allows you to see what is the dip, because the further away it is from the center, the steeper that fault uh, is going to be. OK, we're going to do uh, one more thing over here, and that's going to be uh, to see where those folds are going to be in a more circle. Remember that more circles plot what is the state of stress of a tensor plotting the effective normal stress and the shear stress. And in this case, this is going to be related to the failure property of, of a rock, where I'm assuming that in this case I have no, no cohesive strength. So this is simply the normal stress times the friction coefficient. Uh, let me try that again. All right. So this is the, the shear failure line. Uh, when, when I have failure, that means that this particular block of rock met the shear failure line. So at failure, the state of stress is going to be touching the failure line. Or that also means that the Mohr circle is going to be touching the failure line. And the Mohr circle that touches the failure line is going to be the Mohr circle that involves the minimum and the maximum principal stress. And the minimum is going to be, in this case, the minimum horizontal stress. And the maximum is the effective vertical stress. And the faults one and two, both of them are going to be here at the point where the Mohr circle intercepts the uh, failure line. Those two are going to be right there. And you may wonder, uh, what about the intermediate stress? What is the effect of the intermediate stress? Well, according to this theory, the intermediate stress doesn't play a significant role other than in the orientation of the fault. Uh, well, the orientation of the fault, uh, if S3 is perpendicular to S2, then that means that it's already determined by S3. Uh, but the magnitude of S2 is uh, not going to significantly affect the orientation of this fault. And for this particular example, it could be anywhere in between these two values. So here I'm going to draw something. I'm going to add two more circles. And this is what is called a 3D more circle. And I'm going to explain what, three, what this 3D more circle is in the following video. For now, let's just keep it simple, and we'll see how we use that. But these are two additional circles that relate the intermediate stress to the minimum stress and the maximum uh, principal stress. All right, so these are the ideal orientations for a normal fault under normal faulting conditions 
with this given orientation of the minimum uh, principal stress. And for strike slip and reverse faulting is, is going to be uh, very similar, but now the direction of the stresses is going to be slightly different. So let me make sure that I put them in the same orientation as this figure. Uh, okay. So yes, I'm going to keep the same orientation of the horizontal stresses. So uh, let's do the case of strike slip. Uh, strike slip, the maximum principal stress is going to be horizontal. So this is going to be SH max. And the minimum principal stress is going to be also horizontal. And is going to be in this direction. And the intermediate principal stress is going to be vertical. Well, the one that is not going to play much of a role right now is the vertical stress. And the ideal orientation of faults is going to be related to S1 and S3. And what I want you to remember is that always the ideal orientation of a fault, which is a shear fracture, is going to happen in a plane that hinges from the plane of maximum stress, which is a plane which I'm uh, hatching right now, towards the plane of the minimum stress at an angle of beta, which depends on the friction angle. So again, imagine a plane uh, that, imagine that you have a hinge in this line and the failure plane is going to go from this plane of S1 to the plane of S3 at an angle equal to beta. So that's going to be a plane somewhere over here, where this is beta. And this is one possible solution. As we have seen uh, before, we we're going to have two other solutions. I could have the hinge go in the other direction, or the rotation actually to go in the other direction, and the direction could be this, and this will be also an angle beta. These, these two uh, values are going to be beta. And uh, let me also add here, and beta, which in this case are going to be uh, six degrees. So uh, let's see now what would be the strike and dip for uh, such a fault. And remember that we're still keeping the same coordinate system where uh, this is going to be depth, east, and north. So now observe that the strike is different for these two faults. Uh, let's start with the dip, which is uh, the easiest. What is the dip of these faults? Notice that th those planes have to contain the direction of the intermediate stress, and the intermediate stress is vertical. So those planes are going to be vertical too. And what that means is that the dip is going to be just 90 degrees. It's a vertical plane. And the strike is going to be the angle from a line parallel to the north and the line of a strike. So in this case, if this is a line parallel to the north, the line of a strike or the angle of a strike is going to be this angle. And that angle, notice, if this angle is equal to 60 degrees, then the complementary angle, uh, because this is a, a right a triangle, 
over here, this has to be 30. And the opposite angle is going to be that one, so this one is going to be 30 degrees, because this one is 60. So in this case, the strike of this uh, fault is from the north, 30 degrees towards the west. And for fault number two, is uh, similar, and the strike is going to be, in this case, from the north, 30 degrees towards the east, and the tip, similar as before, is 90 degrees. If you want to place this in a stereo net diagram, uh, you just have to, to follow the same thing that we did before. Uh, I think that, uh, that that's not super difficult, and uh, you, you can revise the solution in the final figure if you have a, any doubt about which direction that is. But it is the same thing as before. And for the more circle, uh, also is going to be something very similar to this, but let me complete the more circle. That's going to take just a few seconds. Instead of having as a minimum principal stress, uh, in, I'm sorry, instead of having as a maximum principal stress the vertical stress, we're going to have as a minimum principal stress the horizontal maximum stress. So this is the failure line, and, and this is the circle uh, that this is the circle of failure. This is going to be sigma h min. This is going to be sigma h max. And somewhere in here, we're going to have sigma v. All right? It's the same thing as before. But notice now the principal stresses are not the same as in the previous case. And for the last case, uh, for reverse faulting, uh, the maximum principal stress, again, now is going to be horizontal, but the minimum principal stress is going to be vertical. So let's see how that's going to look. I'm going to keep drawing as a square the plane of the maximum principal stress. And notice I do this, I do it longer in the other direction, because I hope this reminds you the case of the laboratory in which we fail a cylindrical sample that was relatively, was two times taller than its diameter. And in this case, if you remember, you would see fractures that occur like this. And sometimes, if you were lucky, you will also observe a conjugate fracture. So this is the same thing. And opposite to the lab in which we were loading this with the maximum stress in vertical direction, in nature, it could be like this, like in the normal faulting, but in strike, slip, and reverse, the maximum principal stress is going to be horizontal. So this is SV, the maximum principal stress. Now the minimum principal stress is going to be vertical, and the intermediate principal stress is going to be horizontal. And this is up. Oh. Sorry about that. The maximum principal stress is horizontal. The minimum principal stress is this one, S2. And the vertical stress is the minimum uh, principal stress. So let me check just one more time. Um, yes, this all seems uh, correct. And what is going to happen now? As S1 or SH mark pushes, pushes and fails the material in, fail, in, in shear, uh, notice that now these blocks are going to have to move along the direction of the maximum principal stress but also uh, pushing up against the minimum principal stress, which is vertical. So in this case now, 
the fault that I would expect is going to be not very steep. It's going to look like this. Again, at an angle beta from the plane of S1 towards the plane of the minimum principal stress. So, let's see what's going on. So here, okay, let's see if that works. It's not working. Just give me one sec, I figure this out. Touch, color. Okay. This will be the plane. Uh, actually, I should do it with all solid line. Up, sorry about that. So it's going to be the line. Uh, this is going to be the plane, and this is going to be uh, such all plane. One sec. In a way, this is switching to to righty. All right, that's a, that's a, the the fault plane, and the angle is uh, beta uh, from this vertical plane, the vertical the plane of S one towards uh, the plane of the fault. And as you might expect to, you're also going to have a conjugate solution or uh, alternative solution, which is going to be a plane that goes like this and fails the rock like that, where now the angle beta is that one. And if we proceed now to write, if this is number two and the other one is number one, the strike of such fault of number two, you see it's going into the east-west direction and the dip is, how much is the dip? It's not beta, no, this is not beta it, because beta we know is 60 degree for this case. This is a lot smaller. Again, complementary angle, 180 minus 90 minus beta, the result is 30 degrees. The dip is smaller than in the other cases, and in this case, I'm missing something. Number two is dipping towards the north. And number one, the strike is also east-west, and the dip is also 30 degrees, but this one is dipping towards the south, is getting uh, deeper as you goes towards the south. And you could also uh, make the stereo nets for these cases. You could also make uh, the, the more circles. And it's very similar to, to what we saw before. Let me complete this by adding the coordinate system just to make sure that in all the cases, this is all the same. And just making sure that my microphone is working. Uh, okay, and th in these cases, all is the same. Okay, so you may think, or oh, these 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 are too many things to remember, and probably uh, I'm not going to remember all these uh, rules about the strike and dip. But uh, don't worry much about that because I hope that you noticed that there was just one rule that I was following in the entire process. And it's always to recognize which is S1 and which one is S3. Because that's all I need. In all these cases, it's always going to be true the following. If I had 
a material that fails in shear like a rock and it has a frictional strength then always that shear failure in three dimensions is going to be related to the a maximum principal stress the minimum principal stress and the intermediate stress and it's going to be always a plane that forms at an angle of beta going from the plane of the maximum principal stress which is this one going to the plane of the minimum principal stress which for this particular case you may also think uh, on the plane which the hidden side of this rectangle that we cannot see very well over here but it will be the plane going from the plane of the maximum principal stress to this side plane that we, we cannot see if you had a, a hinge along this line this is what uh, how it would hinge how it would move and when it rotates it would form a shear failure at an angle beta again where beta is 45 degrees plus friction angle divided by 2 notice that this friction angle is going to vary it's not going to be always it's not going to be always 30 degrees so it might be different uh, so you have to keep that in mind and the conjugate solution for that will be a plane that also goes from the plane of the maximum principal stress towards the plane of the minimum principal stress in this case if we have the hinge in this line it will move in the opposite direction and it will go like this and the planes are going to result from here are this and this is going to be your angle beta where beta again is 45 degrees plus friction angle divided by 2 so this is all you have to know if you know this you can solve any problem you just have to put this in the right context you need to know in which direction is s1 and which direction is s3 which in all these cases normal faulting strike slip and reverse faulting is going to to be different so uh, let me show you uh, I think I have a cool example here about a normal fault that I actually uh, took a picture myself in a in a recent trip and uh, let's see if uh, I find it quickly okay right here it is so look look at this photo uh, this is sandstone and you can see here uh, some char characteristic lines that look like uh, faults and I hope that you can also see uh, and appreciate we have some secondary faults over here along this direction so in this case it appears that there was a, a dominant fault which is this one uh, dipping uh, towards these cases let me remember uh, towards the west and these ones are uh, dipping towards uh, the east and you could also judge from the angle of these faults that uh, these appear to be uh, reverse conjugate faults so the scale of these you, you can see there I think there are some small cacti around here but this is about uh, 40 to 50 feet uh, cliff of sandstone uh, you can see very nicely these uh, these rocks that were exposed because there is a river that goes through here and eroded uh, some of those blocks and these other uh, lines those are uh, open mode uh, fractures or fracture joints uh, not related to shearing 
Okay, so this example that you see right here will be equivalent to looking to this example from the direction of SH mean. That will, will be the uh, ideal stress that cause uh, such uh, fractures. Okay, uh, so uh, I encourage you to try to uh, figure out uh, these ideal orientations in the stereo net map. Remember that we do have this help, uh, this uh, app to help you see what is uh, the orientation for different kind of uh, for di different dips and, and stripes. And I am not worrying too much about the more circle over here because that's what uh, we're going to see next. Let me do just uh, work on one example that uh, it uses the concepts that we have seen before in order to uh, predict what will be the orientation of uh, shear fractures or faults, and also will be the ideal orientation of a hydraulic fracture at the given place with a given ori orientation of stresses. The part of the hydraulic fracture you already know, but still we're gonna use it uh, to complete this particular example. Okay, so uh, here we have a problem. This is the problem statement. We need to find the ideal orientation of a hydraulic fracture and for faults as well at a location in which we know what the stresses are and in which direction the minimum principal stress is oriented. So we know this is normal faulting. Uh, we know that the vertical stress is a principal stress. That means that the horizontal stresses are also going to be principal stresses. And we know that the direction of the minimum principal stress is north 60 degrees towards the west. This is very important because in this case, now I have an orientation of the minimum principal stress, which is not the same case as in this example. This example, that uh, strike or that azimuth of SH mean was 90 degrees. In this case, it's not 90 degrees, it is 60 degrees. And we have a friction angle of 30 degrees. Okay, so at this point, I will encourage you to use what we just have learned, uh, just pause your video and try to solve it on your own and see if you can get uh, to the solution. And I'm asking you to, again, to find the ideal orientation of hydraulic fracture, uh, something that you should know by now, what would be that, but I'm asking you now the extra effort to write what would be the strike and dip for such plane, the plane of the hydraulic fracture. And also the strike and dip for the two possible solutions of a shear fracture. So uh, go ahead and try to do that, um, pause your video, and once you have your solution, uh, then play again the video and I'll tell you what the solution is. All right, so uh, I hope that you could work through that and you uh, were able to find the, the right solution for this problem. And here, uh, this is the solution, what you should do is you should make an schematic of your uh, solid or your cube with the directions of the stresses uh, for your particular problem. Let me tell you what the trick is in here. Now the horizontal stresses are not in direction east, west, and north, south. So it's a little bit more difficult to draw this in 3D. It's actually quite difficult. Uh, in this case, I was able to do that because this direction of the horizontal stress were aligned with the east or the north, and, and that's not too difficult to do. But if some of these stress are not aligned with the cardinal directions, it gets a lot more difficult to do. So what I'm doing instead is I'm just drawing a top view. So here you see the east, the north, and we cannot see the, the third axis, which is depth, but it's going down. And uh, you, you should keep that in mind and you should try to imagine this in three dimensions, although we're just drawing it in two dimensions. Okay, so uh, the first uh, thing that I'm going to do here is to recognize what is the direction of the minimum principal stress. In this case is 
60 degrees from the north towards the west. So this is that angle. And what this is telling me, what is the direction of SH mean, which is this direction, uh, and it is at 60 degrees from the north towards the uh, west. What I'm going to do next, after I recognize this line, is to draw perpendicular lines to this direction so that I draw square uh, that respect the orientation of the horizontal stresses and is perpendicular to, to the horizontal stresses. So uh, if, if I were to do that from scratch, this is probably what, what I would do. Uh, if I know that this is the north and this is the east, I know that the minimum principal stress is at 60 degrees from the north towards the west. OK, so I would trace a line that actually goes to the center. It's a lot e easier if you do going through the center. That's going to be the line of SH mean. Perpendicular to that is going to be the line of SH max. And here I can draw now a cube that doesn't have to be exactly a cube, it could be a rectangle, but it's uh, a geometry that allows me to see what is the orientation of these uh, cube in three dimensions with respect to the principal stresses. So in this case, now uh, let me, just for convenience, let me delete this and that, and I know that this one is SH mean, this one is also SH mean, and these are SH max. All right, so I know this is uh, 60 degrees, and now the next step is, uh, after I know that, I can already tell uh, what is uh, going to be the orientation of a hydraulic fracture. So the first step, the hydraulic fracture is always going to be a plane, ideally, perpendicular to the minimum principal stress. Since the minimum principal stress is SH mean, S3, that means that this is going to be a vertical plane. The hydraulic fracture is, is going to be a vertical plane, and this is going to be the line of a strike. And this is a vertical plane, so that's why we see it just as a line. What will be the strike of that vertical plane, well, it's going to be 30 degrees because it is parallel to this line, perpendicular to SH mean. If this is 60, this has to be 30. So the strike is 30. What is the dip? It's 90 degrees because it is a vertical plane. That's for the hydraulic fracture. What about for the fault? Well, the fault, uh, if we use always what we saw over here, remember, it's going to be composed. The two faults, the two possible solutions are going to be planes that go from the plane of the maximum principal stress to hinging on these two lines to the plane of the minimum principal stress at an angle beta. And what that means from this particular case and from this particular problem over here is that let's look at fault number one. Let's say this is a hinge. That means it's going to be a plane with where this is the line of a strike and it dips 60 degrees towards the southeast in this direction. And for this particular, uh, for this other solution, again, this is going to be the straight line, strike line and it's going to be perpendicular to the minimum principal uh, stress, the strike, uh, but the plane is going to dip at 60 degrees towards the northwest. Uh, so I hope you can see this in three dimensions. To me, it's a little bit difficult to explain uh, with this screen, but remember this thing, you should put it in the context of 
let me bring that, of this solution over here, where what we're looking at right now from the, uh, from the top is this plane, these two lines of a strike are these two lines, and here, uh, since this is a 2D plot, we cannot see the dip, but we have it with these geological symbols. And where the dip is 60 degrees, because in this particular case, friction angle divided by 2 plus 45 degrees is 60 degrees. That's why this is 60. And the 30, remember, is related to the orientation of SH mean. Okay, so I hope you... Uh, you, you can see what is the reason of this and uh, and you can uh, understand why you would have those uh, directions for a hydraulic fracture and for these two faults. And you have an explanation of all of these here in the notes. And there is also another problem which is a little bit more challenging. In this case, we have a, a strike slip example. And remember, whenever you have a strike slip, that means that you're going to have two different strikes and one dip. Uh, but as long as you always apply this concept, uh, you will be able to find the solution. You don't have to memorize anything. You just have to understand the concept underneath uh, failure in three dimensions with three different stresses, which is this one right here. And you will be able to solve any problem. OK. so. With this, uh, I finish uh, this video. From now on, I'm going to be making videos by topic. So for every single uh, lecture, uh, you're going to, to see that probably for lectures we'll have one or two videos or, or maybe sometimes more. Uh, but uh, just remember that you follow all the videos that apply for a particular uh, lecture. OK? Well, I hope you understood that. and. We'll continue with the other topic in a bit.